Welcome to part two of chapter nine. Uh, the second part uh, of chapter nine is devoted to motivating people. Now I would say this is the so-called holy grail of project management or management in general. I think I already told you many times that uh, being a manager uh, means getting work done through other people, leveraging other people to do what's good for your company. That's what management is largely all about. So that's why it's the most important question. So how do you make sure that people do what you want them to do as opposed to doing what they want, right? How do you make sure that people come to your, to, to your uh, organization, come to their office and work hard as opposed to going to, uh, going to the lake and fishing there all day, right? Or how do you make sure that people invest into your company as opposed to investing into themselves, you know, their own self-interest, their own education and so forth. So this is like a more subtle issue. So how do you do that? Well, a short answer by motivating them somehow, finding a key to motivate them. Uh, because this question, how do you motivate people? How do you make them uh, do what you want them to do? Uh, because this question is so important in the world of business or life in general, uh, psychologists and management theorists, you know, some people say that management is a science is basically applied psychology. It's all about understanding the brains, the cognitions of employees. So, uh, so scientists uh, have devoted much research and thought to the field of managing people at work, uh, more specifically motivating people at work. And some of the answers that we're giving to this question, how do you, ma how do you motivate people or, or how do you manage people in general, uh, you know, some of those answers, some of those theories, some of those frameworks and techniques, they fall into three areas, motivational theories, influence and power, and effect, personal effectiveness. So motivation theories means it's, mo it's more about giving people reasons to be productive within an organization. Influence means somehow pushing them towards the goal that you want them to achieve. Power means a bit more coercive pushing, meaning forcing people. And then effectiveness means just uh, being effective yourself as a leader in terms of communicating what needs to be done, coaching, uh, mentoring other people so that they can achieve uh, their full potential. So, uh, so we'll, we'll discuss all three areas uh, in this presentation. Now, the first uh, thing worth discussing uh, in relation to motivation is the so-called distinction, uh, is, the, is the distinction between the so-called intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. I mean, as you can see from this word, intrinsic uh, motivation, it's something that happens on the inside. You know, intrinsic motivation causes people to participate in an activity for their own enjoyment. So uh, there is something inside uh, of their brains, inside of their uh, minds, that tells them that they should be doing something and, and this something brings them a lot of joy. There is nothing on the outside, right? There's nothing external, right? So for example, let's say you have somebody who likes playing tennis or, or let's say soccer, right? I like using soccer example because uh, this is something can relate to culturally. Now think about playing soccer or football. Now, playing soccer involves what? You have 20 guys on the field and they're running behind a ball, right? And there are millions of people watching and they're so happy when they score a goal. They're so upset when their team is losing. Now, if you think about this, right? If you think about it, it seems like madness, right? I mean, why would anybody, I mean, think about it, adults chasing a ball on the field. Like, why would you ever chase a ball on the field, on a field, right? Why would you want to do that? But you know that there's something that is, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a part of our instincts, but it, there's something intrinsic that motivates us to play a particular game. Children play soccer, they play football, nobody's telling them to do that, right? Nobody gives them money for that, nobody gives them candy for playing football, but they like it, right? So there is something on the inside that causes them to, 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 to do this particular action, right? So that's intrinsic motivation. Uh, now... Of course, there's also something called extrinsic motivation. Uh, it's something that causes people to do something for a reward or to avoid a penalty, right? So extrinsic motivation, it's something along those lines. I will play football because somebody will pay me money for that, right? So that would be extrinsic motivation. So something that happens on the outside of your mind that, that forces you to do that. Or I will play football because I want to be admired by my peers, by other people. Uh, kids in school, right? So that's more of an extrinsic motivation. Um, now, an, an interesting question, which one is, is more powerful, intrinsic motivation or extrinsic motivation? Now, research shows that intrinsic motivation is a more powerful force than extrinsic motivation. 
Uh, there is a lot of research uh, in the field that I find quite fascinating called behavioral finance. Um, you know, there's research, research that shows that there's so much extrinsic motivation can do for you. Uh, there's one research that I like that, uh, that shows that uh, after a certain level of salary, and I think the, uh, the estimate that they gave was around uh, $90,000 per year, you're not motivated by money anymore. In other words, you can double somebody's salary after that mark, but their motivation, their happiness will not increase by much, right? So intrinsic motivation, it's, it's something that is more powerful. It's a much powerful force, you know, something, something that drives kids to play piano, or play different games. And if you think about it, I mean, uh, maybe you've heard it like in other fields. I mean, you cannot become successful in something just because there's a lot of money in that. Of course, I mean, you can, right? But the chances are just so slim. And even if you're disciplined and intelligent enough to become successful in something that you don't like, right, but something that pays well, you know, at the end of your life or at the end of the, uh, of the day, I guess, right, uh, you know, at the end of a small period, you'll feel upset, you'll feel frustrated and unhappy. And all those famous athletes, you know, all those famous celebrities who became successful and who, who also got some of that extrinsic motivation, meaning money, fame, I think they're the ones who are, first of all, intrinsically motivated. I mean, they were just obsessed uh, with golf from, from, from the childhood, like Tiger Woods. I mean, something that people don't know that, you know, Tiger Woods, uh, he has been playing golf since he was like four years old, right? So they've been, obs he has been obsessed. He's been so immersed in this game since he was a child. And that's what makes people successful and brings them extrinsic rewards as well, right? So, um, uh, to kind of, to translate this into the world of, of business, you know, that's what I've noticed. You know, there are some people who just like their job. I mean, I've met a lot of people who, like, for example, professors, right? I, I met a lot of people who love teaching. You know, they like doing research. Sometimes, you know, if you have their salary, they will still continue doing that, right? I've met a lot of people like that. And, and then there are some people who, who, who don't like what they do. And even if you pay them a lot of money, they will, you still feel that, you know, they're not motivated. They have other priorities in their life. So the key here, find people who are intrinsically motivated. I mean, find people who are passionate about their jobs no matter what. I mean, those are the kind of people you want to have on your team, not the ones that, uh, you know, quickly got a certificate in networking because they believe it will give them, uh, you know, a good job or a good salary in, in the near future. So look for people who are intrinsically motivated. Now, when it comes to understanding uh, human motivation, there's one uh, central, one uh, famous model um, by Abraham Maslow. It's the so-called Maslow hierarchy of needs. Uh, so what this model does, it argues that humans possess unique qualities that enable them to make independent choices, and it gives them control of their destiny. Right? I mean, it's a very high-level summary of what it is. But uh, on a more practical level, uh, you know, uh, on a more practical level, uh, Maslow uh, says that there is a hierarchy of needs. Hierarchy means uh, there, is a, there is an order among needs that humans have. Uh, and people, behaviors are guided by the sequence of those needs. So when I show you this hierarchy, uh, you, know, uh, you, you will see what I'm talking about. So this is Maslow hierarchy of needs. So basically what this pyramid says, at the very bottom, and here by bottom we mean low-level needs, right? We have the so-called physiological needs. So the first thing that we humans need to satisfy, we need to satisfy our need for food, uh, water, shelter, and so forth, right? We cannot live without having those basic needs satisfied. Once you satisfy those needs, you move to higher order uh, need, uh, which is uh, physical safety, economic security. So now that you ate a little bit of food, um, uh, once you have uh, a room to live in, uh, once you have access to water, then you start thinking, okay, what about the future? Will I be able to provide food and water and shelter for myself in the future? So you start, you know, once you satisfy your immediate hunger, you start worrying about long term. So it's like safety needs. Then so once you satisfy that, so let's say, you know, you found a way to make a living, uh, you're earning decent money. Now you start worrying about social, your social needs, you know, acceptance, love, association within a team group. So you start worrying about friendships, about dating, about getting married and so forth. Once you satisfy that, you, you move to a higher level uh, of needs, which is recognition, prestige, status. So in other words, you want to be recognized, you want to be special, you want to be different, right? And then you have the highest level, uh, it's self-actualization. Self-actualization -actual means you don't worry about recognition, status, prestige, uh, you want to respect yourself. You, you want to make sure that you're the best person you can ever be. You want to leave some kind of mark behind yourself, some kind of legacy, right? 
So what this, uh, so those are low level needs here at the bottom, those are high level needs. So what Maslow argued, he argued that people progress through those levels of needs. Now, uh, I think most of the time uh, this pyramid is linked uh, to age and there is some truth to that, although not always, right? I mean, I've seen some old people who are somewhere here, right? And I've seen some young people who just don't care about those basic, you know, economic trends, you know, they're already somewhere here. So it's not necessarily related to age. But indeed, uh, like I've, 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 I've seen like many co I actually just recently I had co-workers saying something, you know, one of my older colleagues and friends saying something like that. You know, he said something, you know, uh, you know, we're discussing something. I don't want to just go into the into the details of our discussion to make uh, the story short. But he, he brought it up, something like that. He said, look, you know, I'm an old man. You know, I'm about to retire. I'm about to face God. Do you really think I, I care about those things that you're mentioning, right? And uh, one of the things that I was mentioning was salary, right? He said, look, I don't care about salary anymore. I made enough money, right, throughout my career. I just want to have a good life. I want to live a happy life, right? So that's what he was trying to tell me, right? So, so yeah, with age, a lot of people move to this top. And then when you have young professionals, they're somewhere here, right? There's still a lot of uncertainty surrounding their lives and careers. Some of them simply don't have enough savings to rent a house or rent a room, right? And uh, they are worried about their, their career prospects. They know that if they don't get a job, they will have problems with food and water, right? So young people are somewhere here. So when, you, uh, so when you're dealing with employees, we, uh, try to understand which level they're at right now, okay? Now, people, a person like Warren Buffett, he's somewhere here. I mean, if you know uh, the life story of Warren Buffett, you know that he never cared about prestige status, right? He, he really believes that he, you know, he, his job is to allocate capital, is to leave a mark, and he, he gave all of his money away to charity, as you probably know, right? Because he's somewhere here. He doesn't care about recognition. He drives an old car. He doesn't have a driver, right? All those, all those things that show that he doesn't care about prestige and status. He's probably somewhere here. He wants to leave a legacy. But then again, there are some people who are successful, but they're like somewhere here, right? Look at me, you know, uh, look at my watch, look at the car that I'm driving, right? So you need to understand, you know, and so, so if you have a young employee who is still somewhere here, then don't offer them something like this. Now, don't say, oh, you know, you, you're going to change the world, you know, follow me and you will change the world because some of them, they're here. I mean, they need to have those needs met first, right? Again, when you're dealing with somebody who's experienced, who already made enough money, who made a name for himself, then that's how you can motivate this person by saying, look, uh, if you work on this project, you will leave a mark, you will leave some legacy behind you, right? It's not about making money. It's not about uh, satisfying your basic needs. It's about leaving some kind of mark behind you in this world, right? I think this thing is also overlaps with the fear of dying, right? We're all, we're all afraid to die. Uh, not necessarily like in a sense that we're terrified, but uh, I guess there's this philosophical notion that if we're about to die, then our life doesn't matter. So many people are concerned about that. So they want to make sure when they die, when they go away, there's something left behind, right? Kids who remember them or people who appreciate uh, their charity, their donations, you know, and stuff like that. So just understand where people are. And once you understand which level they're at, you will find a way to motivate them. Now, another famous theorist in, in the uh, field of motivation uh, is Frederick Hertzberg. Um, he, he wrote several famous books, uh, but uh, one theory that he was famous for is the distinction between motivational factor, factors and hygiene factors, right? He was, again, deal, he was trying to, to basically answer the following question, what motivates people at work? So his answer is, is, is as follows. When it comes to work, there are the so-called hygiene factors. You know, those hygiene factors, they are necessary, but not necessary and sufficient reasons for somebody to be satisfied and motivated in his or her work. For example, salary, supervision, work environment, they all need to be there, right? However, giving somebody, as I, as I told you before, based on research, giving somebody a high salary sometimes is not enough to make this person satisfied and motivated. So that's when motivation, uh, motivational factors come into play. Those are the factors that are both necessary and sufficient to increase somebody's satisfaction and motivation level. So here we're talking about achievement, recognition, the work itself, giving somebody responsibility, making this person respect himself or herself better because this person has additional responsibility, opportunity for advancement, growth, and, and all those things. There's nothing, uh, and I know this from my own experience, there's nothing more uh, demotivating and, dis and dissatisfying knowing that your hard work leads to nothing. There's no opportunity for advancement, there's no growth, uh, there's no increase in responsibility, 
and that's when you start hating your job and looking for something else. So here we have uh, those factors listed in the table. So, so what Herzberg is saying, he's saying make sure hygiene factors are there. Don't worry about them much, but make sure you provide people with health benefits, with salaries, right? Reasonably safe and attractive work environment. They need to work in an office that is air conditioned in, in summer, uh, warm in winter. Give them a computer, right? But all those things, they will not motivate people. If you want to motivate people, concentrate on achievement, recognition. Give them a work that they like, right? So that they're motivated by the work itself. Give them more responsibility because if they become in charge, then it's no longer you telling them what to do. It's them being in charge of their life and careers. Give them opportunities for advancement and growth, right? That's what motivates people. You know, I can attest to that. I've seen it so many times. Like sometimes, you know, uh, I remember in my previous job, we have this annual banquet uh, uh, luncheon where, where like, you know, supposedly best employees in different areas, they get uh, recognition, right? And what this recognition involves, typically it's like a plaque. Right? I don't know how, ma how much money it costs, maybe a few dollars to make, right? Some kind of medal or some kind of award that says, you know, the best, uh, you know, the best advisor, the best salesperson, something like that, right? And, you know, I mean, I was always like a bit skeptical about it. I, I mean, you see, like I was thinking, well, you know, this is laughable. First of all, like those awards are not objective. Who knows how they come up with those awards? Number two, it's not like they're giving you a lot of money, right? I mean, they're just giving you like an A4 sheet of paper with your name printed on it, right? So I was like laughing that people, they uh, desire those awards so much. And, and believe it or not, I've seen people crying when they were, you know, adults crying when they were hoping to receive a particular award. Uh, but then uh, the committee somehow gave this award to somebody else, you know, the person that they hate, that they think is undeserving. I've seen, believe it or not, I've seen people crying after those luncheons because they didn't receive that A4 sheet of paper with their name on it. But when you think about it, it's not silly. I mean, it's it, those people who are crying uh, when they don't receive uh, uh, an award. Uh, I mean, they're not completely rational. You see, there's something beyond salaries, right? It, it just this whole idea of recognition where the entire company, or at least your boss says, look, we know what you're doing. We, we like it and we recognize you. We recognize your effort, right? And also that it's something that hurts you really bad when nobody's recognizing what you're doing, right? So keep in mind, those are the real motivators. And think, you know, if you're smart uh, as a manager, you can take advantage of those. I mean, it doesn't cost much to print uh, this A4 sheet of paper with somebody's name on it and put it in a nice frame and give, give it this thing to, uh, to this person in front of everybody. But it can matter a lot to this person, really. And again, not because this person is completely insane or irrational, right? It's not because of that, because we like recognition, right? It's something that makes us happy and fulfilled and so forth. So, so that's what Herzberg is teaching. If you want to motivate people, concentrate on those, but make sure those hygiene factors are also there. Now, when it comes to like this overall approach to motivation, there is another interesting set of theories uh, by somebody named uh, Douglas, Douglas McGregor. And uh, he, I think he started with this theory X and Y distinction, and then later on some Japanese professors came up with this theory Z. So that's what he said, you know, uh, what, what, what uh, 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 Douglas McGregor said, he said, in the old days, and I think he was using United States as, as, the, context, as the cultural context of his studies, of his work. So he was saying, in the old days in the United States, managers assumed that workers dislike and avoid work. So managers must, must use coercion, meaning, um, you know, uh, may, must force their employees. They need to use threats and various control schemes to get workers to meet objectives. So the assumption is that workers are lazy, humans are evil, uh, they don't like to work, and you need to force them, you need to threat them, you need to threat that, that they will, you'll fire them, and that's how you get the work done. Now, uh, and I think that was indeed true uh, if we're talking about 100 years ago, up, up until uh, this uh, famous or infamous labor movement uh, that happened somewhere in the first, that started somewhere in the first half of the 20th century, I believe, in the United States, or maybe even before that. And then gradually the, the attitude has shifted to the so-called theory why. Uh, theory why assumes that individuals consider work as natural as play and rest and enjoy the satisfaction uh, of esteem and self-actualization needs. So theory why says people love work. As a manager, you just need to let other people do their work because they love it. Just give them the resources, give them the, the opportunities and they will do a great job. So respect people, uh, um, you know, give them a benefit of a doubt and they will do, you know, they will thrive and so forth. I think nowadays theory why is much more common, although, you know, probably here and there you still see a boss that is stuck in the 20th century or, or maybe the 19th century, right? Theory why is more common, uh, again, quoting my boss, who I respect a lot, uh, one of my former bosses, he said something like this, 
uh, being a leader is about letting other people shine. You know, let other people shine. Let them achieve things. And that's what, that will be a positive reflection on you as their boss. And then you have Theory Z that seems to be like, I wouldn't say it's like a more advanced version of Theory Y. It's more like, a, you know, a different direction. And as you can probably tell from this Theory Z, it's influenced by Japanese slash Asian culture. So it was introduced by William Aouchi uh, and is based on the Japanese approach to motivating workers. So Theory Z emphasizes trust, quality, collective decision making and cultural values. So uh, the reason this approach became popular, as you probably know, starting probably uh, somewhere in 1980s, uh, Japanese companies started to outperform American companies, uh, more specifically in the uh, auto industry. So that's why a lot of American professors, a lot of American managers, they became interested in how, ma how Japanese managers manage their employees, right? And that's what they discovered. It's all about trust, right? It's all about building relationships where you trust people. You probably know that there are some Japanese companies, uh, you know, automakers that worked with their suppliers for hundreds of years and they have this trust-based relationship, right? So for hundreds of years, they don't, uh, uh, you know, they, they uh, don't betray uh, you know their partners expectations uh, collective decision making everybody should be included everybody's voice matters like for example when one area where you saw collective decision making was quality what Japanese manufacturers said they said that quality uh, you know is everybody's job even the person who is cleaning the uh, uh, the factory has impact on quality because if, if he or she doesn't clean everything properly then let's say dust will get into paint and paint will flake easily and that will have an uh, overall impact on, on the quality perception of this car towards this car so everybody needs to be involved in cultural values so respect people people's cultural values uh, make sure your managerial practices your work environment does not contradict what they believe in because if it does it will kind of destroy them and they will not be productive employees so theory z is different from theory x and y um, so those are approaches. So you know you just need to you know decide as an individual which theory you'll practice, right? And probably theory X doesn't work that much, but sometimes again you need to use theory X. Sometimes um, I think like for personally um, uh, what I do, I think I'm more like uh, uh, you know I, I emphasize uh, I emphasize uh, theory uh, why in my work I let other people shine. I try to let them shine. But if they're not shining, then after a while, you know, you, you just need to say, look, if you don't do it properly, you'll get fired, right? Because you cannot be nice all the time to people and, you know, uh, expect that they will shine when they have no motivation. So sometimes you need to use theory X. Um, when I worked in the Middle East, I've noticed that series, uh, theory Z is very important, especially when it comes to collective decision making. I think it's a matter, it's largely a matter of politics and also cultural values uh, where people uh, are... Uh, used to making decisions in the tribal fashion where you know, tribe is a tribe meaning it's a closely knit community where everybody matters so sometimes even if I don't intend to listen to certain people I still include them in decision making at least to show them uh, respect because if you don't do that it will violate their cultural values their cultural norms and your decision no matter how good it is in theory will uh, face fierce opposition so those are the theories that you need to keep in mind uh, when you deal with people Okay, then there's also, um, you know, uh, some theories about influencing people, you know, something that is related to influence slash power. So, so here you have like some ways, to be honest, I'm not familiar with those researches, but those are like common ways of influence people. So you can influence people, meaning you can make them do what you want them to do through authority. So you're saying, I'm your boss, you need to do it, right? Uh, sometimes through assignment, uh, it means the project manager's perceived ability to influence a worker's later work assignment. If you cannot fire a person, then you can hint that next time you, you will assign him or her to a, to a very difficult project, the project that is likely to fail. Sometimes influence is done through budgeting. If you don't do this, next year I'll cut your budget. I will not give you nearly as much money for your department. Uh, promotion is a powerful tool. Do this, and next year uh, I promise you'll get promoted. Money. Uh, you know, if you increase somebody's pay, then the person will be more motivated to, to contribute to he or she will be more low, hopefully. Penalty, the project manager's ability or manager's ability to punish somebody. Uh, work challenge, some people are motivated by them. Give them something that puzzles them intellectually or something that gives them an opportunity to uh, you know, overcome their fears, to achieve something. Uh, expertise is another influencing tool. Do this because I know better, have more experience. 
and friendship, a very powerful tool. The ability to establish friendly personal relationships between uh, people with people and then use those friendly relationships to get things done. Uh, I have a practical advice for you, something that I've read uh, in one of those, I guess, self-help books by one, uh, by, uh, by one of the uh, uh, you know, human relationships gurus, something like that. Well, but I believe it's true. You see, uh, try to be friends uh, with little people in the company, in, in the organization. You see, whenever you have a, a big boss, it's hard to become a friend of that big boss because everybody, you know, there are so many people looking up to this big boss, trying to kiss up. So uh, this big boss will not notice you, right? But it's easy to do something nice to somebody who is a low-level employee, right? Because th those people, you know, typically, you know, they don't have as much as many admirers around them. Uh, some people even abuse them because they believe that they're not important at all. So if you do something nice to a person who is in, in a low position, they will actually notice that and they will remember that. So when they move up in the hierarchy, um, you know, they will help you as well. So that's how you build friend friendships within the organization. Help, some, help people that you can help as opposed to trying to be nice to people that are more powerful than you, right? Something like, like that. And, you know, you probably know that this wisdom. Sometimes uh, little people can get a lot of things done. For example, a secretary of a CEO, uh, you know, that person can get so many things done. Uh, that person can help you in so many ways you cannot even imagine. Sometimes... The secretary of a CEO is more powerful than the CEO himself or herself, right? So if you're nice to a secretary, if you give that person gifts, you know, souvenirs, if you acknowledge that person, if you're nice to that person, then you, you, you miraculously, uh, things will get done on the CEO side as well. So, so friendships are very important at work. But again, uh, just like one more, I don't want to dwell on that too much. Uh, I mean, friendships cannot be superficial. I mean, you cannot become somebody's friend by saying, hello, how are you doing? Although sometimes it is a big deal. Like if you have somebody that everybody's ignoring and you're always acknowledging that person, you know, that may work. But uh, friendship is, is always, I mean, any kind of relationship goes both ways, right? It's not about just like, you know, faking it, smiling at people. It's about helping people. It's about doing something that is good, right? Using some of your resources to help somebody. That's how you build friendship. Not by just pretending that, that you're glad to see to somebody, right? Because people are not that dumb and they can uh, sense that fake friendship. Um, you know, research shows that uh, projects are more likely to succeed when you influence people through expertise and work challenges, and you're more likely to fail when you try to influence people through authority, bossing them around, money, or penalty. Um, that brings us to this issue of power, uh, which is, uh, you know, which has a lot of overlap with influence. So power is the potential ability to influence behavior, to get people to do things they would not otherwise do, right? To exert power on somebody. I've seen many, uh, many definitions of power. So there are several types of power. There's coercive power, you know, something that is through threat, do this or I'll fire you. Uh, there's legitimate power. Uh, something along the lines, I'm your boss, you know, I'm higher in the hierarchy, so you need to do this. There is expert power, you need to do this because I have experience, I have knowledge in this. There is reward power, uh, meaning uh, you, you're, you're saying uh, do this and I'll reward you. And then there's referent power. Referent power means like through relationships. Uh, you are associated with people who are well respected and admired and because of that people, um, you know, they respect you as well and they're more likely to do what you ask them to do, right? Something along the lines of dropping names, right? So once again, you know, as you saw in previous slide, probably it's, it's good to lead people through expert power, reward power, uh, maybe referent power. And when you use coercive power, even if it's uh, backed by organizational hierarchy, you know, people may rebel and they may not uh, perform at their top capacity. So uh, this concludes part two of chapter nine. That was an overview of some of the most fundamental theories and ideas uh, about workforce motivation. Thank you for watching.